What if you design a life that you love? What if you create a game worth playing? What if you enjoy the process along the way? Today, we are joined by Gary Gunderson. He's a public speaker, 8500 financial firm founder. He's author of multiple Wall Street Journal number one bestsellers. When we're doing things we hate, it drives us to a level of exhaustion. That level of exhaustion leads to what are our escapisms. Escapism could be overeating or just zoning out with TV because it feels so heavy. But you know what happens? When people find purpose, they find energy. Look, we're gonna learn our lesson eventually. It's just how painful does it have to become? And the best thing that people could do is... This is gold, man. This is the real stuff. I'm having a shitty day. How about you, Garrett? Well, look, man, I am definitely moving on from my accountant. And like, I have a tax team and I'm like in this business where I understand taxes, but I have a, right. I have something that has to be funded by the 19th, which means all, all of my, you know, taxes have to be in my personal financial statements have to be updated. And this person said they do it May 1st. And the day that we're recording this is May 11th, so 10 days later. So I've got eight days and it takes time for that to process. So there's a chance that I just get hit with, come up with $1.4 million tomorrow on Mar on the 20th. So like, that's what I was dealing with right before this. Yeah. As I'm also trying to like record, like I'm practicing recording my new book, Money Unmasked, because I really want to make it, like I'm a terrible book reader. If people listen to Killing Sacred Cows, that people are like, this guy talks too fast. Has he never read before? I was like, fair. I did a shitty job on that book. So I'm really trying to like stay ahead, practice, prepare. But then all of life starts to happen, right? Sold my business in 2021. And now I'm trying to get things done with independent contractors that aren't doing what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it or at the quality that I'm used to in the past or whatever it might be. And so it's like everything's taking longer and it's destroying my flow and my ability to just be an artist that's writing books and writing blogs and doing comedy or whatever it is. And it's annoying as shit. That's the bottom line. But I have to look at myself and be like, what am I not doing to allow these people to perform at the best level? How am I not supporting them? How am I not making clear requests? Um, am I, should I pay them more than they're asking for? Like that's the quandary I'm in right now, Jeff. Well, I, I have my own sort of variation on the same theme in a couple different areas that I'm dealing with, but you know, it, it, to some degree, the details don't matter. Like the question is really what matters. And it's that question that, you know, I'll let you state back to me in your words, but what I'm hearing you ask is like, how do you get people to take personal responsibility for operating at a really high level of effectiveness and integrity or what we would, what I, I, the term I always use is operate like an owner. And in a world that I, I think, I feel like underneath what you're saying, there's a, there's an observation that the world seems to be kind of drifting away from this as a, as a non-negotiable standard in, in professional relationships that like, how do you, how do you operate so that everyone around you that you're dependent on also operates more like an owner and, and sort of has that more like old fashioned, what Stephen Covey, uh, Stephen Covey called the character ethic that rather than what now we're dominated by the personality ethic where everybody's trying to be the most interesting and exciting person. But what about just doing really good damn work and delivering things on time? You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, I mean, it's just a, it's just a different world now. And I realized that I had a structure for 20 years. And then when I left that structure, I, I'm like, new to this this new world and i'm also tapping into people who are world class at what they do but then i'm getting bumped for people that are much more famous than i am that they're working on projects with for example right, right. and i understand it because there's more money there's more notoriety there and i'm kind of on the like in the using entertainment to educate that's a new world for me i've been just an educator for 20 years in the world of finance and i'm saying hey i'm going to use comedy or performance which requires music and video and you know, all sorts of stuff. And, and so it's definitely just a, a complete, and plus I'm like talking to TV executives and stuff about these different series and stuff. And I feel like I'm a rookie in the major leagues and I'm, I'm batting zero so far, even though I've got these exciting things happening, like when are they going to have, so there's just, it's like, I have to learn completely new skills and maybe I just have to learn patience, which is not something I've ever been good with. So, uh, you are, you are a living embodiment right now of the saying new levels, new devils, right? You had a previous level that you grew into 
and up towards, let's say for 20 years, like you said, you had a, a previous business, you sold it. Now you're in, you know, what are basically uncharted waters for you. So I'm curious. And by the way, in that, in that, the predictability and the consistency, which was amazing, became boring. It became mundane. It became like where I didn't feel challenged or there wasn't enough at stake. We kind of knew we're going to run a workshop. You know, we're going to have this number of people. This number of people are going to work with the firm. And I'm saying the same things, which I don't like to say the same things over and over unless it's making people laugh hysterically or it's an element of performance and, you know, and complication added to it, like playing the guitar in front of an audience or something like that to take them through an exercise. So, so I, I realized what was good about that situation. And then I'm now looking at how can I leverage technology in order to have less dependence on some of that piece, but where I do have dependence on it, you said it perfectly, new levels, new devils or new, you know, like it's definitely just a completely different ball game. So here's what I've learned most off is I have to create a game that's worth playing. And then if those other things happen, it all has to be gravy, not the outcome. Like filming a comedy special saying, if I get Netflix, I'm a comedian. That's too external and something that's not fully in my control. That should be the gravy and instead say, well, what could make comedy be a business for me that engages me in a way that I really enjoy it, which means I'm not going to comedy clubs anymore. I'm getting paid 25 grand to show up at a corporate event, doing my comedy. I don't have to put the butts in the seats. I just get to go and give entertainment, get paid a lot. And I'm not in a comedy club on a Wednesday night doing an open mic with a bunch of people telling masturbation jokes. It's just a, not the lifestyle that I want. We have to define our game. But then how do the how do the players on the team support that game properly? That's the quandary here. So, so why don't we why don't we take a step back and and give the audience some context? Because like you and I were close enough that like I'm right there in it. Like I have the context on all these battles you're fighting. But it, it might be more uh, more valuable for the audience to have a little bit of backstory here. So maybe let's let's set the stage, and then we'll we'll get back in this in, in these weeds, so to speak. So yeah. your your business of twenty years, your mission that you're on, your evangelism, your books, like set the stage for who is Gary Gunderson and what has he done that brings us back to the present of what you were just talking about. In 1998, I start in the financial services business. The first year and a half, I was a what you would expect out of a financial planner. I pitched mutual funds to them and very stock market heavy with some life insurance as well. And then in 20, uh, in uh, 2000, the market started to go down and that's when I felt my career began because then I traveled somewhere once a month to interview the best minds because I was in my early 20s. And what I found is if you're young, you can tap into some of the brightest minds because they like to pay it forward or they like to see that young ambition. So 26 straight months, I traveled somewhere and I figured, I'm not going to put people at risk in a stock market. I'm going to help them become more efficient with their money. And I geeked out on efficiency, saving them on tax, saving them on interest, saving them on non-performing investment fees, saving them on improper structure with their insurance that was inefficient. And so we then moved into this thing called the producer revolution, which was, look, if people have more money, but their mind's not right, it doesn't really matter. So how do we help them choose to be more of in the producer paradigm where they're adding more value to the world than they take from it in a place of abundance rather than scarcity? And then my partners that I founded that with died in a plane crash in 06, leaving St. George, coming to Salt Lake. And so that was a pivotal moment because then it was like, all right, now what am I going to do after four months of just trying to do everything for everyone else? I ended up creating this program called Freedom Fast Track, which was our flagship program of bringing this concept the Rockefellers have, which is a family office, a family that works, you know, that family has their own financial team just for the family. You have to be worth a lot of money to have that. So I said, how about creating a virtual family office for entrepreneurs so that that, you know, we have all these people on the same page, attorneys, accountants, investment advisors, cash flow specialists, insurance people working on behalf of that client. But that client doesn't have to be worth a ton of money because these people don't work exclusively for them because they don't have the complexity of a Rockefeller family. And so I built that. We did really well with it. And then, you know, I just in 2019, I was like, I kind of want to sell this or I'm kind of bored with this. And, uh, I, you know, we started that process in 2020. I remember my, the, the broker was like, this is probably the worst time for you to sell this business. I'm like, yeah, but I'm just going to sell it internally to people I trust. And then I can still do a licensing deal and create content. But now I'm free to be a comedian. Or I'm free to write a one man show. Or I'm, I've written three books since I've sold that because I now have time to write. So it was about designing my life a lot more 
even though it's my comedy has a tint with money. I have a lot of jokes around that. Or what's even more complicated than comedy is I do this one man show theatrical keynote where I'm teaching about the four money personas and how that works in people's lives because entertainment is the gateway to transformation. There's people weird like us that want to be educated, but the masses just want to be entertained. And rather than have that entertainment numb them out, what if it was to wake them up and help them heal their relationship with money? So I'm here to plant a seed of hope, connection, and expression in the hearts of a billion people through entertainment using love and laughter and entertain, you know, and, and whatever performance will help get them there. So that's an exciting future for me. That's something that I'm looking forward to doing every day. Like I, I jumped out of bed this morning, started you know, reading Money on Mast and recording it so I could hear myself to do a better job with that book. I, I filmed a, a reaction video. I'm starting to just take articles and pick them apart to help people understand what the limitations are and what the other options are because a lot of articles in finance always lead to the stock market and I'm using a little bit of humor that way. So I've just defined a new, a new life, a new game, but it's still in the money world just using a completely different methodology. So there was so, mu- uh, so many you know, really great nuggets in, in everything you just shared. Um, and I'm always trying to filter in, in these, these episodes through the lens of the audience, like what's the most valuable thing we can extract and, and sort of uh, package to the audience. And one of several that jumped out at me in what you were just saying was there's weirdos like us that want to be educated. And by, and I say us meeting, I'm, I'm speaking to the audience too. I feel like if you listen right. to this podcast, you're probably one of those weirdos like us. But the vast majority just want to be entertained. What uh, and this is not a new revelation. Juvenal uh, wrote uh, called it "Panem et Circensum," which is uh, bread and circuses. This is how they pacified, how they managed the Roman Empire, right? Just give the people bread and circuses. But yeah. you're basically saying, yeah, but let's like let's fortify the 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 bread with some vitamins and some stuff that's good for people, and let's I don't know higher value-based performers for the circus or whatever, uh, or, or become one ourselves. So, but I, I mean, I think that's a really, really important insight and props to you for going, Hey, if I'm, cause I, I, I sort of feel like I'd fight this battle too. I, I know, I understand the power of entrepreneurship to transform the entirety of a human life, right? Like if you start focusing right. on acquiring the entrepreneurial skill set, you ultimately set yourself up have way more optionality in this world. And if you really get to what most totally. people want more of in their lives, it's actually, it's just more options and nothing gives you that, like being, becoming an entrepreneur. So I'm always trying to figure out how to take, you know, hundreds of millions and, of, and by the honest, way, Jeff, I, oh, go ahead. Being an entrepreneur and having financial independence where your assets create enough cash flow to cover your expenses. Because totally. then you yeah. can swing for the fences and what you do, then you have options. So option of being an entrepreneur, so you can choose to make adjustments or, or do something different or start something new. And this option of, if you have enough money to cover your basic expenses, especially at a young age, every active dollar you earn builds more of those assets. And you actually have time for quality of life along the way. When people are trading time for money and putting all their money in a retirement plan, there's no time for quality of life. It's just about waiting till you get to retirement because that's their only option out of doing things they hate, where that's just not the real methodology. It's what those schools train people to think though. Yeah, and and I would suggest those are very much in the modern world two sides of the same coin. That the entrepreneurial skill set teaches you how to be nimble and versatile and go where you want and do what you want and have all these fun options in terms of how you can invest your time and energy. But like you said, that's predicated on the financial wherewithal. But I also think in the modern world that that financial wherewithal for most people is is going to be unlocked through entrepreneurship, not through jobs. I mean that's. The harsh you you talk about the model maybe we can go into this but I, I, of like just the economy itself the fundamental macroeconomics of the western world are way bigger and more powerful than your measly attempts to take one percent of your annual income and put it into some mutual fund to try to get ahead of it on the growth curve like you're dead in the water and it's better to just call it now don't waste your whole life delay or deferring or deflecting the obvious call it now and go, oh shit, I need to develop a completely new set of skills. Unless you're, I, I, I would bet it's 1%. I know that 4% of the US workforce actually ever achieves a million dollar net worth while working, which a million dollar net worth now isn't even really enough to retire at any reasonable standard. Yeah. But even then, 96 out of every 100 people don't even get to that. So it's like, 
So I guess to to sort of cert- close the loop here, my point is I'm out, out there trying to evangelize this. And very often I feel like it falls on deaf ears, probably because I don't do as effective a job as you're suggesting at making it entertaining to hear what can otherwise feel like some damn bad news. Well, and look, I've been reading so much every day, whether it's I'm reading everything from Barron's Investor, or Investor Business Daily to Wall Street Journal. And look, all of this puts people in a box of how to think. And those are the people who are even reading that. Most of the population is just going to work, trading time for money. They're exhausted by the end of the day. They watch some sports. Like that's kind of the the nature of it. There's no energy left over. And this, by the way, is message for us parents with our kids is what would it take to give them more options early on so that they don't get stuck with heavy student loan debt that they now feel an urgency to jump into the workforce in something that provides stability and benefits at the expense of their enjoyment and options in the future. And that's how people get stuck is they feel like I better buy a nice car so I could look sexier to this girl or I better get a a, a nice house before I can afford it because everybody else has that. And now millennials even saying, well, how am I going to afford a house at seven and a half, eight percent interest with what just happened with this major run up, you know, in 2021 and 2022 in the housing market? It's and, and the thing is, they start to feel defeated. But the reason they're defeated is because they're taught everything is external to them. They invest in stocks they don't understand. They hire an advisor that doesn't have their best interest in mind. They work for a company that's supposed to give them benefits in the future and pay a salary today. And everything lacks a sense of self-reliance and responsibility. And it lacks a sense of purpose because it is drudgery and it's boring and it creates so much disengagement that they're finally like, I just want to retire. And look, in the industrial age, retirement was a brilliant idea. Can you imagine working in an assembly line or my dad was a coal miner? You want to retire from that stuff. But one of the ways that we should be less afraid of artificial intelligence and technology and embrace it is the more it can replace the mundane. The one key is everyone's going to have to have the skill sets of adaptability, connection, and innovation as far as creation goes so that the people can connect with one another and let the jobs that suck go away. But because a lot of people aren't getting good education, they're getting educated by schools that are antiquated. They're getting educated by schools that are slow. They're getting educated by professors that don't understand and they're not equipped for the workflow. And so this notion of if I just go to college, I'll then have a good job has been I'm a I'm a barista just like these other uh, college degree. I didn't have to go get a college degree to be a barista. I just did it because I want to provide for friends and family. Yet that's unfortunately that too many people are not getting the promise of making more money by getting educated. And we've seen in the medical profession how bad it sucks that these guys get massive student loans and now they're customer service agents for pharmaceutical companies and don't even get to have enough income because everything goes towards malpractice insurance and what will insurance will cover. So like now is a revolution for us to say, what is it that we want to do in the world? And what about invention? Like I'm inventing teaching money through comedy. I'm inventing teaching money through performance and one man shows and, you know, using a score and music to enhance that. That's something that isn't easy but it's a whole hell of a lot easier than doing something I hate every single day in exchange for money. And how, what percentage of people do you think are stuck in that system? Like we've got to just start trusting more in ourselves and investing in our skill sets and investing in ourselves. And I tell you, people will do that if they choose a path they enjoy versus the path they hate. And I think that more things that we hate can be replaced over the next seven years by technology. And instead of fearing it, embrace it. Instead of fearing it, invest back into your skill sets. Yeah, so you're touching on something that is, uh, I think, controversial and emotionally charged. And I actually would love if we just went there because I have all these thoughts yeah. about it. And very often I hold them back. And for whatever reason today, I feel like not doing that. So, because we're uh, friends, you're like, hey, I'm just talking to my buddy yeah. Garrett and people yeah, are exactly. be listening in. <laughs> yeah, we're going to let's have the conversation that we would have if nobody was listening and try to forget that other people are listening and just say what we want to say. Um, I'm just kidding, audience. I never forget that you're listening. I love you. but And I also trust you and believe that you want to hear what I truly have to say. And that is, I agree with what Garrett just said. Garrett, I agree with you. I love what's happening with AI. And like, I mean, e- e- even you mentioned, you mentioned doctors, right? Like there's this handful of jobs. I'm sort of, sorry, I'm sort of balancing around here, but there's a handful yeah. of jobs that are like, oh, well, your life won't suck if you can do one of those few things. 
right? I mean, that's actually the sad reality of the world we live in. It's basically, it's like, you know, most things you're going to end up doing, you're not really going to love, but hang on, someday you'll get to retire and live the life you want, which that's a very specious claim based on both the math and the way life plays out. Well, let me say why it's a a bad claim. Jeff is just reading things. Until recently, interest rates were so low that retirees were subject to low interest rates, not providing enough income. So they had a million dollars that's kicking off 20 grand a year. Number right. two, taxes could go up. They're talking about raising the debt ceiling, which by the way, they're going to raise the debt ceiling. I can promise you, no matter what the fight is right now, all the media is showing to scare people so that they beg for the debt ceiling to be raised. So someone that's abusing their power can continue to abuse it. And then, so if there's high debt, there could be high tax. And then number three, inflation. By the way, this whole notion of inflation, it really comes down to two things that are never talked about. One, they printed money. They added half more money to the money supply in two years. And number two, collusion with corporations coming together to say, we have the narrative of inflation. Let's go ahead and raise prices, even though we don't have to because we have the supply chain narrative and we have the notion of we didn't make what we wanted to make in COVID, so we'll make up for it later. But those are really the two issues is it wasn't even government spending that created the most inflation. It was the quantitative easing of the Fed adding money to the money supply. And guess now what they did? They added money, then they make more by raising interest rates on all that money that they just put out there. Think of how garbage that is. They put all the money out there, then raise the interest rates, harming people that are trading time for money on a W-2 wage that now can't afford to live and now considering a second job or going into debt, which that debt then increases profitability for which institution? The banks, which are now having problems because the banks are having problems, Jeff, because they went and took really low interest rates that they were given money through quantitative easing and put it in treasuries at 2%. And now treasuries are at four and a half percent. And when people want to take money out of the bank, they have to sell those treasuries at a loss because any new person can get four and a half percent. So they'd have to discount those to equal four and a half percent by, by dipping into principal and 50% of banks in the United States are at risk with that because of bad policy, not even government policy, federal reserve policy. So Here's these people in retirement going, great, I've worked 30 years and now everything costs twice as much. Great. See, that's a dumb idea to retire and be subject to interest rates, tax hikes, and inflation because now you're not in control of the outcome of your income. So sorry, I had to had to say something about it as you were going there. It's just my nature. It, dude, no, it's so good. I mean, and that's, you know, I tried my best. I haven't written as many books as you. I, I sort of put all my focus into one and tried to really unpack all this for people. And this was a few years ago and it was, but, but all of this stuff that you just described was written on the wall, certainly 20 plus years ago, definitely 15 when quantitative easing became a play that they were willing to run and rerun and double down on. And I mean, this has all been happening. And so again, you know, I'm out there like, like, uh, I don't know. I don't want to get biblical, but I feel like I'm, you know, John the Baptist running around like this is coming. This is coming. And, I, and I'm Jesus. I'm old Jesus running well, around. <laughs> yeah, you definitely are. Rock. If you're not seeing this, go watch it on YouTube. Garrett like rocks more of a Jesus vibe than anybody I've probably ever seen. Um, but anyway, like this is the world. This is the world. And so, you know, for the for the for the I, I don't want to say the average person, but for the person listening who isn't in that very small subset of, you know, not just professional categories, but like elite outcomes within professional categories. Like maybe if you're on the fast track to become a senior executive at one of the top 10 banks in the United States, then like, you don't need to worry about what we're talking about. You're just going to, you're just going to brute force your way into enough money or maybe ditto if you're on a, you know, a climb at a big tech company. I mean, even doctors, uh, I forget when that book doctored was published, but I mean, 90 plus percent of doctors are are reported as saying that they would not counsel their children to become doctors. And that if they had it to do over again, they would steer clear of the profession. Like there's such a small hand. And by the way, we, we have schools and insurance to thank for that. Schools and insurance are the things that really totally. ruin that profession. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and yet, you know, so I, I look at the world and I say, basically, if you don't have an entrepreneurial skill set, you have probably have a less than 1% likelihood of not getting into the latter chapter of your, the, you know, whatever the later chapter of your life. It's, and also the fact that we're all living longer now and probably longer and thicker, so. unfortunately, Jeff, like yeah. the population as a whole has these things that prolong life, but not quality of life. So right. especially with the obesity rates, especially like 
I mean, I don't know if you went on a cruise when you were in the Caribbean, but my family talked me into a cruise in 2017. And all I thought oh. was we're never going to be able to survive as a species because this is going to destroy us from an insurance standpoint because people were not healthy. And they thought oh, yeah. just because it was all you can eat meant that they had to eat it all. Like it was more people riding around. I felt like we we're on the, on Wally, the cartoon, like people are just riding around on scooters. Like you could just walk the stairs by yourself the whole time you were there. It was, it was kind of a, a sad state of affairs, but that's because when we're doing things we hate, it drives us to a level of exhaustion. That level of exhaustion leads to what are our escapisms? Escapism could be overeating or just zoning out with TV because it feels so heavy. And we've yeah. got such bad philosophies and education and structure. And even we've made the cheapest food subsidized that is the least healthy for people. So it's just this epidemic that we're facing. But you know what happens, and you see this more often, is when people find purpose, they find energy. When yeah. people can make their purpose profitable, they start to be healthier because they that higher energy means they have something left over to possibly work out. Or they've got extra money to be able to Ha get good food you know like i i can order food in that's really good from a food service that, that gives me my my week's meals but if i wasn't an entrepreneur could i afford to do that and if i right. couldn't afford to do that maybe a 99 cent hamburger at mcdonald's that has pink sludge and that doesn't decompose over 10 years might be the option so it's unfortunate but the thing is this all begins early and that's like i wrote a children's book for about money that comes out in january because i think that's the key i think Convincing 50 year olds about this is a tough game. We're talking to people who probably are already doing a lot of the right things listening right now, right. the people who aren't, they're already, they're already stuck. They don't, they don't, this doesn't attract them. Right. But what if we could start going to the kids and start giving them a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of idea, a little bit of structure. That's not just trade time for money. Well, you know, I, I can speak directly to that. I run one of the largest entrepreneurial education platforms in the world and our yep. average customer demographically is in their late forties, male provider for their family. And probably some of that is because I'm the face of the company and I am in my forties male provider for my family, right? Uh, we need to maybe diversify our ambassador. You know how to speak to that and you know how to, you, you, you're an well, example of what's and, possible with that. Yeah. And, and I represent a very thin slice of a very large category that really gets a lot of shit nowadays, right? And and it's all the people that have bought into the grand lie. I call it in my book, the broken system, the the big meta narrative that you're describing. And what I would what I would uh, what I would say. It, it, and so anyway, I I guess to to finish that thought, my point is, it's like the great vexation of my life that to reach that audience, the audience that frankly looks like me but doesn't have as much freedom and doesn't have as much money. It, I have to basically, like, I'm always in this tension of like, I have to try to make it sound, I say I have to, I basically refuse to, but they want me to make it sound easy. They make, they want me to make it sound fast. They make me make, they want, they want me to make it sound like they're not going to have to acquire any new skills. And, and basically like, it's just going to be some like bullshit. Hey, can I just find something business. that's done for me? Can yeah. I just, yeah. someone do this? But like, and, what do we start this call with? We or what do we start this, this with was. The difficulties we're facing in how our life is that when there's more stakes, there's more things to manage. There's more stewardship, and right. it's and and some of the mentality filters down into those people that that we work with. That that big narrative impacts them in a negative way. It creates entire yeah, and, victimhood. You know. And if I was willing to just tell people what they wanted to hear, I could probably acquire customers online for about a a tenth of what I currently pay because I actually say, listen. It's hard. It's grueling. You're going to have to do it in your spare time, which means giving up some of your other escapes or distractions, but at least it's freaking possible. And what other path is there in this world where it, meaning time abundant or time freedom, financial freedom, uh, you know, sort of the abundance consciousness where that's even realistic? I don't know what that other path is other than entrepreneurship. But what I would encourage the audience or, or you know, maybe the, like you said, the audience, they're probably already, we're preaching to the converted here, but like, go find somebody else and say, hey, the, the silver lining of the world today is that it sucks so bad and your future is so bleak that maybe for the first time in your life, you can enroll yourself in the idea that you actually don't have anything to lose because the path you're on is going to be just as bad as anything else. 
to take that chance to find that passion and build the skill set around it that allows you to turn your passion into a business, your passion into a profit center, and go create a completely different life. So, I mean, again, I think the only silver lining right now might be that it's getting the bleakness is Don't so visible yeah. that people will like, change. I got to do, I, Jeff, in 2008, 2009, it was tough. Like, people weren't sure when we make it through the banking system, the crisis. Our company grew so much in 2010 because everyone was willing to listen. Yeah. In 2020, when everybody had fear, our company, grew, even though we know we did no events, where no in person, where we were doing at least one, two, or three sometimes a month, we didn't do any that year other than February. And you know what? We did fine because people were willing to listen. So, look, we're going to learn our lesson eventually. It's just how painful does it have to become? And and the best thing that people could do is what you've mentioned over and over. We've got to develop skill sets. Like we've got to look at investing in as ourself as a core value, as a core function of what we do, instead of relying on someone else providing all of the opportunity. And then we get stuck in a system where we feel disengaged, where we don't feel appreciated, where we don't feel happy. And that we're just waiting for the day that we could so-called retire so that we finally don't have to do the things that we hate. Well, what if you design a life that you love? What if you create a game worth playing? What if you enjoy the process along the way? Like one of the things, one quote I heard from Kobe Bryant that I loved was he said, the win is in the work. Like, yeah, he won five championships, but he outworked everybody because he saw that as part of the enjoyment was the work mattered because it was a game that he loved. And so not everybody can be a basketball player, obviously, but you know what? One time we were filming uh, my origin story and my wife was talking about there wasn't a job for me. Like I got offered a lot of jobs. I graduated college in 99. It was a peak in the market. I got offered right. investment firms, uh, institutional investing, uh, investment banks. I had a pick. Like I had 11, 12, 13 offers, but none of them spoke to me. So I just created my own business and my wife was talking about it. My youngest son at the time was seven and he said, what do you mean dad just invented his job? invented what he wanted to do. She goes, oh, that's what an entrepreneur does. And he said, I want to be an entrepreneur. See, planting that seed at seven years old, then he was like, well, what if I create a sneaker company where I buy sneakers and sell them? Or what if, you know, he started to think that way. My nephew who's 10 has already had little businesses where he's selling popsicles at the softball game when it's hot and he's got major markup on it. And you know, it's like, it's just, there's all these things that we could do when the stakes aren't too high. When I was 15, I started a car detailing business. I washed and cleaned cars. When I was 16, I would pick them up and drop them off. I won $5,000 for being the Young Entrepreneur of the Year for the state of Utah at 16 years old. I spoke for the first time at 15, presenting this business and won $500 on a business that only had $700 in net income. I learned about income statements and balance sheets when it was simple, when it wasn't hard so that as time went on, I grew into it. You know, And that's the thing is kids aren't learning these things and therefore they think that the only way to make money is to be an influencer on social media or to be an athlete. And it's like, those are so few and far between, you know, the message of most rappers are, if you just work hard enough, then you can be rich like me. And then they end up dying because like, you're not going to be rich like them because they are not really rich. They're very flash in the pan and in a dangerous world, you know, using really negative lyrics, even though I love a lot of rap, there's just a lot of it that leaves some, you know, some uh, better career. So, so that's, that's part of it is we're not reaching people early enough. You're reaching amazing people at a time of life where fortunately they're listening to you and you've built the biggest way to do that. And you've got a lot of leverage in that platform. So I'm just saying you and I could think about how we reach kids. I, I was always annoyed when my clients for 20 years say like, what are you doing for the kids? I'm like, damn, I'm am I not doing enough for the adults? It's as hard as right. hell as it is. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, kid, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to fund a business when your customers are children. Right. Especially because now the kid has to want it and the parents have to want it, you know? Yeah. Like it's, yeah, you have exactly. to sell it twice. Yeah. I mean, so we, have, we have, we have pilot programs that's actually going in a few high schools, but we, we pay for them. I mean, we're, we're going to have to probably. Yeah. I did two I, programs in colleges. It made me zero dollars. I just did yeah, it as a gift. We, we've, we've identified we're in the second year of a pilot program that's uh, it started in two high schools. And now we actually have a group of charter schools a third set of sites. So it's actually going to be, you know, 15 schools um, this year, but we're, nice. we've identified, we're going to need to do it for five years before we have the data that allows us to even have a shot at a school district paying to have us come into their school. So it's like, like you said, there's no money in, in children, but 
And I have a great connection for you that knows where the money is and how to navigate that. So she's helping me with the children's book and getting that. So like, I'll, I got a great connection for you. Okay. I mean, easy. Thank you. Yes. I, I yeah. humbly receive that, that possibility. And that's what entrepreneurs do, man. We got to create the value creation game for one another and collaboration is the key, right? Like you're interviewing all these different people to give different perspectives and have conversations. Like it, we've got to change the narrative. We've got to change yeah, the conversation. That's that's a really good. I'm I'm glad we 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 went went here where like this conversation and the broader set of conversations that I'm having with my podcast and you're having through your career and 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 we're just like I want to let the world know there's a whole other world of the uh, call it the entrepreneurial and I actually say the new Darwinism is survival of the most entrepreneurial and there's a whole group of us that actually like it's hard we we work our butts to, I mean I, no one in this group is lazy. I mean, I'll say this, I've interviewed a couple hundred really successful, mostly entrepreneurs on my show. There's other types of performers too. Nobody that's really successful, frankly, nobody whose life, this is maybe is a bold statement, nobody whose life doesn't suck in the modern world isn't working their ass off or did for a very long time. Uh, but anyway, to most people where whose, whose, re, whose existence consists of maybe going to the job, commuting, clocking in, sitting at the desk, being surrounded, like... We mo most of us live in, in very large echo chambers that just reinforce what, what we've heard and what we're yep. going to keep hearing. So I'm just, I, this is an open invitation. There's a whole other world of us. And the cool thing about this world, this entrepreneurial world, it, it is the most egalitarian, open-minded, like, uh, opportunity, you know, it's what everybody wants to be fair, where it's like, it, we'll take anybody into this world if they're just here to produce value and deliver value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's amazing how transparent it is. And, 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 you know, the big thing that you're saying there is we all have to become better at receiving. Sometimes people get isolated because they think they should have everything figured out and they prolong the mistakes and the pain because they're unwilling to ask for that support or grab onto that education. Like, I feel like no matter how smart and dialed in you are, if you're going to do better than 80% of your, of your capability, it requires outside perspective for that other 20%. And that other 20% can be such a huge difference in your life. So if you're willing to be open and vulnerable and talk about what's really going on, other people can bring their resources and ideas. And when you, you know, if you think that time, money, or ability are limitations, those three things are only limitations when you try to do too much on your own. When we think we have to do everything by ourselves, we get limited and we have a ceiling. When we're willing to have a clear vision and we speak to that and when someone says, how can I support you? And you tell them three or four things. Do you know someone that, like I have a book coming out, I'll be like, who do you know that might love this book and be willing to interview me? You know, uh, I'm looking for people that are amazing editors that, um, that have time and capacity because we have limitations. Like I know things I could ask for. And maybe Jeff, you probably have like, I know this person or you know someone who knows something. And because people don't ask for support, they don't receive that value and they get stuck carrying on too much on their own. And that's where we get hit with too much burden and we hit our bandwidth and energy gets decimated. So that's where we have to be like willing to receive. Like every entrepreneur you know is good at giving, right? They're good at doing, they're good at, at that. But how good are they at asking? How good are they are at receiving? That's, I think, what takes them to another level. Yeah, I would, I would. I would strongly agree with that. And that's, to me, that's one of the, the later entrepreneurial skills often that clicks in. Uh, like, like, I mean, we hear on day one, it's all about delivering value. Right. And so we're like, I gotta, you know, I gotta sharpen my saw, increase my production capacity to produce and deliver value. And then there's typically, you're going to reach a point. I mean, the way I see it play out is you kind of reach a point where you're like, I'm doing all the things that I think I'm supposed to do to be a successful entrepreneur, an entrepreneur or successfully be more entrepreneurial and it isn't working. And then a lot of times there's that, it's a really soft set of skills that unlock a lot of times unlocks the highest levels of achievement, right? It's like, why, why do I struggle to ask for help? Or why does my frustration come across as an edge in my tone? And it starts to become about not achieving the next visible thing or climbing the next visible rung it's more like becoming self-aware enough to at least have a sense of if not a specific picture of all the opportunity costs that you're paying in your life yeah. because of who you haven't become yet and yeah. then doing that work 
So well that said. seems like well said, well articulated. Well, thank you. So so that seems like a good opening to ask you, because you're at those elite levels. Who are you becoming? What is some of that work that you're having to do to unlock those next level? What's interesting is I have at least every week where I have someone with outside perspective, one-on-one -on -one coaching me. So every other week I work with this girl, Kelsey, and she has me go through this process of, is there anything I haven't forgiven in myself or others that could be holding me back or clouding things? She takes me through a process of accepting it and forgiving myself and others so that I can process the emotions and not, have the, not let those emotions be heavy on me. Then I have another guy, Brian, I meet with about once a month where it's all about, hey, as I'm clear about who I am in the world and what that means spiritually, how do I connect that to the world so it doesn't diminish who I am from a spiritual experience? So it's all about how can I be in the world but not of it? Meaning that whole narrative you're talking about is being in the world. You know, the woke, the, the you know, you're responsible for everyone else's problems and, and you neglect your own. And so like I work with him and then I have this other girl, Allison, who really I hired her just for my wife and I. I don't know if you know Allison, my wife at brain camp. So I had, so Allison, I do once a month, like, but it's interesting. It was for like, we did birth trauma stuff, which was like super oh, yeah. helpful. She had me get like just a, a food journal. Cause I'm like, you know, I want to get just in better shape. She's like, well, are you do journaling your food? And I was like, you know, I hate my fitness pal. Cause I don't want to be on my phone. So I just got this food journal and I, I dropped a percent of body fat in the first week and a half. So like, I just have these outside perspective people, but I start my day in the sauna. Uh, while I'm reading everything in finance and then I'm listening to my spiritual mentors while I'm in my cold plunge and doing stretches before the day starts. I'm writing in my five minute journal to start the day. So I, I'm doing all these things to create the right um, context and also to put on like a suit and armor of abundance to ping off the scarcity that might come if I'm not that intentional. So I just begin my day right and then I have good people in my life and then conversations with people like you leave me inspired. And then I'm just really good at like this last week, I had four different days where I hosted people in my house. We have one of the best views in the entire world, but definitely in Utah and, and up here. And I just make them food and, you know, do my barista skills, making coffee. And we, I just get inspired by them. And a lot of them like, Hey, I'm going to make this connection for you. Or, Hey, when your book comes out, let me promote it. So like, I just find that investing in those relationships helps me to stay on course so that I'm not isolated, exhausted, frustrated or just stuck in the work all the time. And then I go tell jokes and telling jokes is super fun. So, you know, I think that the, the question that that description of your life begs for, for me too, and certainly probably for most people is like, what would I have to say no to, or what would I have to start saying no to, to create the space in my life to have fun. kind of what Garrett just described? Because I mean, I, you know, you talk about bread and circuses. It's really time. It's society has created this infinite set of options that it will slot into every available gap you give it in your schedule. Right. Unless one of the guys that was at my house was Dan Martell, which I think oh. you just interviewed him on his book around time. So yeah, like yeah. he was love Dan, but, but the, yeah, the, you, I, I look at my calendar at least once a week and go, what didn't represent who I am as a human being that entered my calendar? What do I need to let go of? so I can have the space for what I adore the most. And then I'll even use little tools like this productivity planner, right? That this is what I'm doing today. So I, it's 25 minute segments. I estimate what it is and then I can rate how I'm doing. And what I do is that allows me to say no to other things. Mm -hmm. And my assistant knows what to say no to, right? And even when like, nor right now when people are saying, hey, you wanna do my podcast? I've said no to everybody. I didn't say no, I said, can we do it in September where my book comes out? But I said yes to this with you right now because I'm like, well, I just want to talk to you right now because we have a hard time getting together to talk. So this is a good way to make that happen. But again, like I'm just looking at my calendar. What do I need to let go of in order to grow? What do I space do I create? Like I just wrote a, a blog on um, the road to don't and another one on busy is the enemy of creativity. And it's all about how we create space in our lives. And that space allows us actually to avoid diminishing marginal productivity. Diminishing marginal productivity is we work harder, we're there more, but we're getting less done because of a level of exhaustion. And when we have time for relaxation, rejuvenation, and recreation, then all of a sudden for me, my writing is better. All of a sudden I'm more present. All of a sudden I'm not feeling guilt for not being around my family because I've invested that time with them because I've designed my week. I've designed my life. And I just taught my wife, who you know, this system of how to structure her days. 
where what is she doing now, which lives in her calendar? What is she not doing, which means she'll review it in two weeks, but it has to get done within six weeks. What she's never doing so she can eliminate it from her life. And the parking lot, which is okay, she can revisit that, but it doesn't have to be done now. And then structuring her days where she's got Mondays and Thursdays for specific things, Wednesdays for different things, Tuesdays for a different thing, and Friday is a flex day. It's totally changed her life where she doesn't feel so busy and she's got time to herself. And so like, it's amazing that, you know, I teach this to people all the time. And my wife finally said, Hey, can you help me with this? I'm like, yeah, you just have full access to me. So we never sometimes, you know, do these things for the people we're closest to. Well, it's also uh, probably a sage marital strategy to teach your spouse <laughs> only when invited. When invited, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I always say that sometimes my accountability feels like pressure. And so I'm only yeah, going to help yeah. her with accountability when fully invited and when every other option has been exhausted. Well, t- to your point, though, about about busyness, um, I w- as you were speaking, I thought of the Carl Jung said that hurry is not just of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Yeah, I have a, and, I have, I have a big red book back there of Carl Jung behind yeah, me. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of Jung, but. I guess, anyway, speaking of, of hurry and schedule and time management, we're technically out of time for yeah. our allotted, allotted scheme here. Um, so maybe we'll just end on that note. And given uh, our relationship, there will probably, uh, certainly, I would say, be a part two to this. I would hope so. I mean, you know, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Maybe, maybe we just need to start scheduling like a quarterly podcast and then that'll actually I, get us on the phone. Together. I'm up for it, man. I'm down for it. Let me know. So, so share, if you would, with the world, uh, Garrett, you've teased it at some of your, your immensity of greatness, but I'm sure the world now is wanting to know more and go, go further into that. So tell them how to, how to find you. Look, man, I'm treating it like it's 2006 and started a blog this year in 2023. So GarrettGunderson.com forward slash musings. It's raw and vulnerable and deep, and that's probably the best way to really get value um, at no no cost. GarrettGunnerson.com is my website, but you can go to the bottom and take a quiz to find out your money persona, which is the hidden forces that determine your financial success or failure. So I think that that's super helpful. But yeah, that's probably the... the uh, people go to Garrett.live and check out my uh, YouTube channel. I'll tell you some YouTube is meant for the masses and maybe not for everybody that listens to this. But if you look at me picking apart articles, I've seen through the matrix of everything that's going on in the economy, and it's very predictable and easy to know what's going to happen next. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. But once you know what's happening, it it just it allows you to know what yeah. to do with your money a whole lot easier. Yeah, I, I was exposed to a lot of the the red pill. Uh, you know, my my journey took me through a channel that ran very close to Garrett back in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. And Gary, you know what I'm obviously some of what I'm talking about, and and it's it really is it's like taking the red pill, you know. And I've never seen money the same way. Frankly, no, through not coincidentally, I'll say that's also about when I actually started making really good money. And frankly, being worthy of it because I knew how it worked, mm. what it meant, what to do with it. Yeah, uh, that's. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So uh, hey, first of all, dude, I love that you started a blog. Like you said, that's so like. Uh, you know, counter, counter to the narrative. The, Cause I love it. Right I love writing. It is like, yeah. I am, I am sharing my warts in that blog. I'm sharing the worst moments of my life and what I learned from them. So I think that that's important. A lot of times I do these immersions one-on-one with a client where they'll just hire me for a whole day. They fly out here, we go to my cabin. And when they're like, man, I'm getting sued and they're crippled. I'm like, I got sued once and I write about it. And I talk about yeah. what I learned from it and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, it's that kind of stuff, right? That's in, and so uh, there's some emotion to it. If you read my old books, there wasn't a lot of emotion. I didn't have that access. Now I do, which I think is more helpful and more memorable. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. What's between most people and their calling? That's the, the holy grail of entrepreneurship. When you have a calling, you're not working. When you have a calling, you're inspired. When you have a calling, you wake up in gratitude. A calling is the most coveted place that we can be. And AI is going to take the careers away. It's not going to take the callings away.